Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, the All-Compassionate, the All-Merciful. Uh, do you have my voice clearly? Could be louder. Could be louder. All right. Um, I would like to thank the organizers of this wonderful conference and the kind participants, every single one of you. I'm especially honored uh, to see Professor Awani here, and I'm a bit nervous about that, I must confess. Thank you very much for your presence. So um, th my talk is going to be about Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, in Rumi's teachings. How does Rumi portray uh, the prophet of Christianity? So the objectives of my paper is as following. This paper elucidates Rumi's perspective towards Christianity, particularly Jesus Christ's role in spiritual progression. The paper's thesis posits that Rumi's teachings reveal a profound interconnectedness and shared spiritual truth across religious narratives and the solution of ideologies. I lost the line. Ideologies. Differences. Dif dif ideological differences upon attaining spiritual elevation, emphasizing Jesus' role in spiritual development and portraying an emphasis on themes such as love, self-improvement, enlightenment in Christianity and Islam. Now, uh, before delving into um, Jesus Christ's portrayal in Rumi's thought, I must first explain what Rumi thinks and uh, about other religions. So in Mathnavi, uh, Mathnavi shows Rumi's respectful stance towards prophets and religions. He underlines the superficiality of disparities in ideolo ideologies and faith. He says, yes, there are differences. Yes, there are different religions, but he, he sees these differences as different perceptions that people get because of their limited or differing understanding. So for Rumi, as Jalaluddin Homai puts it, the difference is this solves upon attaining a spiritual elevation. So when you get that unveiling, when you get the spiritual elevation, the, the, the distinctions go away. Nonetheless, Rumi acknowledges the hierarchical distinctions among prophets, with the prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, host, hosting, holding the highest rank. So if we look at it from um, a Western lens, we could say, again, in, from a Western lens, that he is an inclusivist when it comes to religious pluralism. You know, in, uh, the inclusivist points of view says that, yes, there are different other religions, they are respected. There is one I, I hold on to that is higher than the other. For us, most of the people here, I think it is Islam. Uh, but they do not reject other religions. I'm talking about Abrahamic religions. We respect Christianity as a true faith regardless of the distinctions or regardless of um, how they differ from our religion. So it seems to me that Rumi reads that way. This distinction, that is the distinction between prophets, resembles differing intensities of the same light. So we have the same light, there are different intensities, with one highest intensity being the prophet of Islam, the other is uh, prophet of other religions. The light of the Prophet Muhammad, Rumi says, unifies Muslims, Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians into a single hue, emphasizing the universality of spiritual truth. Um, so the differences between religions result from individual perspectives and comprehension levels. And this is uh, fascinating. So basically what Rumi is saying is that um, there is a tribe in place X without any, like, potent intellectual background. There is a messenger, uh, but their religion, their faith, whatever we name it, uh, is going to be different, and the expectancy towards their acceptance and performance of that faith is going to be differing from someone who is born, say, in Cairo, in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Iran, in Iraq. They are not going to be in the same level. Different understandings depending on different circumstances, and I wholeheartedly agree with this. Rumi neither validates all differing viewpoint, viewpoints, nor does he discredit them entirely. He appreciates the diversities of human understanding extending beyond religious differences to the broader scope and sphere of knowledge acquisition. But uh, let us compare Rumi and uh, Jesus Christ 
um, like in their approach uh, towards the divine. So needless to say that the main differences between them is their temporal uh, difference, the time they appeared in, their cultural differences, their unique religious context, one from Christianity, one from Islam. Um, but these are general, but the most important thing is their different conceptions of God. For Christianity, we have Trinity. For Islam, we have this, uh, the one transcendent yet imminent, real, who emanates, who manifests themselves and permeates throughout existence, no matter whether you're in the corporeal, imaginal, or spiritual realm. Uh, there is one, one, one single reality that is appearing as this emanation. So uh, the, the main difference would be their conception of God. What is their similarity? Needless to say that it's, uh, it's mystic love. Both Rumi and Jesus Christ emphatically and passionately emphasize the mystic love in their, in their uh, spiritual journey. Rumi's Sufi teachings echo the potency of love as a transcendental force, a remedy for suffering, and a transformative power fueling a spiritual journey. So what happens is, uh, I, I could give, like, not me, any philosopher or a mystic could give a whole three-hour lecture on what mystic love in Sufism or in Irfan is, but I'm not here to do that. But just to summarize it, Mystic love is the fuel in the spiritual journey. For Rumi, heart is the instrument that takes you to the divine. That is, that is the window, that is the lens that you pass through. But what is the fuel? That is, that is the mystic love. And we see this uh, in Persian mystical poetry. We see it in um, Fez Kashani, who says, Ishq mara pishe shod, dar ragu dar rishe shod, nist mani dar miyan, in namanam ust ust. Love became my guide. It became my, it, it went into the root and it sprout. There is no I remaining in me. It's not I, but he, but he. Um, so for Rumi, it is also the case. Uh, love is the driving force. Life, love is the key in his mysticism. And uh, as he says, it's the, uh, it's the remedy for suffering. Magarke but if love's pain should conquer you, with this pain, the sorrow of the heart you can cure, says Rumi. For Jesus Christ, it's also the, the case. Um, we have in Matthew 22, verses uh, 37 to 39, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Jesus uh, extends this command to love one's neighbor as well, which, which we all famously know. Elsewhere, says Jesus, and this is fascinating, I was fascinated by that passage for the first time I saw it. He says, this is Jesus speaking, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but if I do not have love, I am nothing. So here he is introducing love so powerful that he sees his faith, he sees his prophecy as meaningless, as nothing without that love. He continues, if I give all possessions to the poor and give over my body to the hardships that I might at my boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So to summarize, he's saying, if I perform all the pious acts, but if I do not have love, that means nothing. That is how important love is for Jesus Christ. Therefore, these points demonstrate a shared emphasis on love in both Rumi and Jesus Christ's teaching. I'm not going to be reading this passage, but I'm going to be explaining it to you from a fascinating passage in Fihe Mafi in uh, for, for, for Rumi's work. Uh, there is this uh, curious passage. He says, uh, well, the path of uh, Prophet Jesus was the path of solitary uh, seclusion rohbaniyat in Arabic, asceticism, if, if I may translate it. You go to mountains, you, you, you seclude yourself from the society, uh, you refrain from lust, from excessive food, whatever, and you reach the divine. But he says the path of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu is not the same path. Rumi says, um, according to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu God reveals to me, the Prophet, a higher path, and that is marriage. Getting married 
and going through the hardship that marriage provides. So, so says Rumi, and this is directly his words. Um, marriage for you is a self-cleanser. Your spouse for you is a self-cleanser. So through your spouse, you're cleansing yourself, and this relationship is mutual, reaching spiritual elevation. So uh, we have this famous poem from Rumi who says, uh, he, he speaks to God in a symbolic way. He says, you are Moses and I'm your staff, referring to the scriptural narrative that said, uh, Moses threw off his stick and his staff and that staff turned into a serpent. He says, be a John, referring to God, be a John, توی موسا به این قالب اسای تو چو برگیری اسا گردم چو افکندیم سوابانم He says, God, you are like Moses and I'm like your staff hold me in your hand I'm motionless, throw me I'm going to turn into the serpent, the monster that you wished me to be devouring the other serpents So to interpret this, he's referring to the divine will and his absolute submission to the divine will He says, I have no motion of my own hold me still, I'm going to do that Throw me, set me onto a mission, I'm going to do that. Toi Isa wo man morgat, to morgi saakhti maz gil. Chenan ek dardami dar man chenan dar oj parranam. He says, God, my Lord, you are like Jesus Christ, and I'm like your clay bird. Again, referring to the scriptural narrative. Hold me in your hand, I'm lifeless. Breathe into me, I'm going to be soaring into his skies. I'm going to go through spiritual uh, progression. And this is one of my favorite lines in Doom, in Divan. It says, خداوند خداوندان صورت ساز بی صورت چه صورت می کشی بر من تو دانی من نمی دانم. Creator of creators, formless form giver. What form you shape in me, you alone know. I know not. Again, he's showing his absolute submission to God and the divine will. So, Jesus' portrayal in uh, Rumi's thought goes as Jesus is portrayed as a divine figure embodied in human form yet beyond the physical world's limitations. Uh, we have in Mathnavi, book 6, line 29, 72, Jesus came in the guise of a human yet bearing the essence of angels. Elsewhere, he says, again in Mathnavi, uh, he emphasizes Jesus' transcendence of the mundane. Despite his human form, essentially Jesus resembles Gabriel, Jabrail, liberated from anger, desire, and trivial worldly matters. Through an unwavering commitment to self-restraint, asceticism, and spiritual devotion, Jesus is portrayed as transcending humankind. So in Divan, Rumi likens, interestingly, Shamsa Tabrizi's life giving breath to that of Jesus. He says, like, look, I, I was dead. I was dead. You came and you, you revived me. And your breath is like the breath of Jesus Christ, life-giving scriptural narrative of Jesus Christ, uh, resurrecting the, de the dead. In Mathnavi, Rumi proposes embracing death to our worldly desires. This death is different. He's saying die to the worldly matters, die to your extra lust. Uh, he proposes embracing death to our worldly desires, needs, and ego, nafs, spiritual emptiness, and this is surprisingly similar to Meister Eckhart's texts, especially his sermons. A spiritual emptiness, says Meister Eckhart and Rumi, that paves the way for resurrection, symbolized by Rumi's breath. A metaphor, a metaphor drawn from the biblical and Quranic narratives where Jesus resurrects it. Uh, Luke 8, verses uh, 49, 56, Quran, chapter 5, uh, verse 110. So, the motive symbolizes a uh, spiritual rebirth. Again, for both Meister Eckhart, that is for Christian uh, mysticism and Rumi, a transformative awakening that underscores the human's intrinsic bond with the divine. Surrendering, surrendering to divine, surrendering to death, to worldly death, primes us to receive the reviving and remolding divine breath that is symbolized as uh, Jesus Christ's breath. So, um, yes. Thank you. 
Uh, in conclusion, uh, Rumi's teaching elucidated a profound interconnectedness across religious narratives, emphasizing the spiritual progression embodied in the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Although Rumi's teachings highlight the distinct path within Christianity and Islam, Rumi underscores the shared spiritual truth, the centrality of love and spiritual enlightenment, transcending religious boundaries. He honors the validity of both past, this, both paths, Islam and Christianity, fostering a respectful, importantly inclusive discourse on, discourse on interfaith dialogue. Therefore, Rumi's theological perspective fosters understanding and mutual respect between the two religions. I'm going to claim in my next paper, not in this one, because that requires like a larger space, uh, that Rumi's view could be in like in uh, contemporary uh, uh, debates about uh, religious pluralism. We could fit him from a Western lens again with emphasis, not with um, you know, um, Islamic narratives, Islamic vocabulary. It could be fit into the narratives of uh, inclusivism and uh, perennial philosophy. But that is the debate for another talk, another paper. Thank you so much for your patience and listening. <laughs>